Good afternoon, everyone. This is our first colloquium of the semester. Before we start, um, just a quick update about the the colloquium that we had to cancel because of snow two weeks ago. So it has been rescheduled to the fall semester. So I know you guys are not going to be required to be here anymore next semester, but um, it will be a good talk again. So stay tuned. It's my pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker today, Dr. Cynthia Clopper from the Ohio State University. She is an associate professor in the Department of Linguistics at Ohio State. She earned her bachelor's degree in linguistics and Russian from Duke University, her master's degree in linguistics from Indiana University, and also her PhD degree in linguistics from Indiana University. After she finished her PhD, she won a prestigious postdoc award from the National Institutes of Health to work on her postdoctoral research at Northwestern University before she went to Ohio State as an assistant professor. I have to use my cheat sheet after all. <laughs> Dr. Klopper has published extensively in the uh, general areas of psycholinguistics and phonetics. Her particular interest is in, on the topic of dialect variation, the effect of dialect variation on speech production and perception, and that's what we are going to hear about today. And because of her good thematic-focused research program, her research now is being supported by another prestigious grant from the National Science Foundation. She has also served on the editorial board of Journal of Phonetics. She's also currently an associate editor for the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America. So um, just for people who are not in acoustics, these are the flagship journals for our area. She has taught a wide range of undergraduate and graduate courses in phonetics, phonology, and speech science. And she has won an award for mentoring undergraduate research. And I have also learned from her website that she enjoys travel when she's not doing linguistics and she's a college basketball junkie. So maybe we can get an update about Duke basketball from this talk as well. So let's welcome Dr. Klopp. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction. Dude, oh, they're out of the top 25 for the first time in like 10 years. <laughs> it's a bad week to be here. Um, thank you very much for inviting me and for arranging this beautiful weather for my drive down from Columbus. It's outstanding. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, effects of exposure, context, and task demands on lexical processing. <laughs> But as was suggested, this is going to be in the context of dialect variation uh, and some other sources of variation as well. So before I begin, I just want to acknowledge um, that this work was done with a number of collaborators, uh, Zach Jones, Janet Pear Humbert, Terrence Mahdi, and Abby Walker. Uh, and it was also supported by both undergraduate and graduate research assistants in my lab, who are all listed here and uh, is supported by a grant from the National Science Foundation. All right. So the major focus of my research, as Dr. Lee just said, is variability and how we handle the variability in the speech signal in speech processing. So we know that the speech signal is highly variable, and this variability comes from numerous sources. So there are both linguistic sources of variability, things like phonological context, so sounds affect the realization of each other. Uh, lexical sources of variability, so different words are produced in different ways, and that affects sort of how the individual segments are produced across different words. And also things like discourse context. So we produce words differently if we've just said them, or if they're highly predictable in the context, or if everyone knows what we're talking about. There are also indexical sources of variability, so things like speaking style, right? I talk differently in this context than when I'm on the phone with my mom. Uh, and also things like age, gender, region of origin, native language status. All of these factors contribute to variability in the speech signal. So this variability is ubiquitous, it's everywhere, it's all the time, 
But it's not random, it's highly structured. And as listeners, we use this variability to glean information from the speech signal. So we can use this variability to get linguistic information. So for example, co-articulation, this phonemes affecting each other, is actually very informative. It provides redundancy about what the segments are. Um, and the variability that's due to things like lexical properties or discourse context help us figure out what the words are, what the meanings are, how the words fit into the meaningful context of the discussion. So the linguistic sources of variability provide information about the linguistic content of the utterance. Similarly, the indexical sources of variability provide information about the speaker. So who the speaker is, how old they are, where they're from, right? And as listeners, we use that information to make decisions about who we're talking to. So this variability is helpful, but it's also problematic. Right? So we know that linguistic sources of variability affect lexical processing, so things like high-frequency words are more intelligible than low-frequency words, words with few neighbors, that is words that don't have a lot of words that sound like them, are more intelligible than words that have lots of other words that sound like them. A word that is predictable in a given context is more intelligible than a word that's not predictable when it's presented in its context, and a word that's repeated in a discourse is also going to be more intelligible than a word that's presented for the first time in its context. The indexical sources of variability also affect lexical processing. So different speech styles are differently intelligible. So clear speech, when we're trying to be clear, when we're hyper-articulating, that's going to be more intelligible than speech that is not hyper-articulated, where we're just sort of chatting, right? Familiar talkers, familiar dialects, familiar accents, all of these are going to be more intelligible than unfamiliar talkers or unfamiliar dialects or accents. So one of the primary models that is often used to account for these sources of variability is an exemplar approach, and in particular an exemplar approach to linguistic representation. And under this kind of an account, the representations themselves are labeled collections of previously encountered tokens or exemplars. So my representation of the word bad is every token of the word bad that I've experienced in my lifetime. And I have a little collection of them. And then I also have a little collection of every time I've heard the word hat. And so we assume um, when we're talking about these models that the individual exemplars decay over time. So a recent encounter with the word bad is going to be more strongly represented, it's going to contribute more to this collection than a, um, if I heard the word bad three years ago or when I was five or whatever. And then finally, the process of recognizing a word, or that is a new token in this sense, involves computing the similarity between that word that I'm listening to and all of this other stuff that I have remembered. So I've remembered all of these uh, individual exemplars, and to figure out what I'm listening to now, I compare what I've heard to all of those exemplars, and I kind of find what's the category that is most similar overall to what I'm hearing. That must be what I'm hearing. So these three components of this approach allow us to account for these effects of variability that I was just talking about. So this idea that representations are themselves these collections of exemplars give us frequency effects. That is, something that's highly frequent, that means we have more exemplars representing that thing. So we have a better representation of that thing, so processing that thing is going to be easier. Right? So this gets us effects like high frequency words are more intelligible than low frequency words, I have more experience with high frequency words, I have more exemplars, I have a better representation of high frequency words, so when I encounter another one, it's easier. The same is true for familiar talkers. If I have a talker that I interact with a lot, I'm very familiar with them, I have lots of representations, lots of exemplars of that talker, it's easier to understand them the next time I encounter them. And the same would apply to dialects and accents. So this frequency effect, this notion of having collections of exemplars, gives us these frequency effects that we see um, in terms of both words, but also talkers and dialects and 
The idea that exemplars decay over time gives us recency effects. So again, as an exemplar decays, it becomes weaker. And so a recent exemplar is going to be stronger. It's going to contribute more to my representation than a less recent exemplar. And so that's going to give us effects like repeated words being more intelligible than new words. New words don't have to be brand new. They're just not sort of immediately relevant, right? So if I just said a word, I have a recent exemplar of that word. Going back and recognizing that word again is going to be easier than a word that I haven't heard for an hour or five years or whatever. Uh, recency effects can also account for things like the local dialect being more intelligible than a non-local dialect. It's the dialect that I'm hearing around me, so I have a lot of recent exemplars of that dialect versus a dialect maybe that I've heard less recently that's not local, that's not around me, that I'm going to have um, a more long distance, long time relationship with, the representation is going to be weaker, it's going to be harder to recognize that dialect. And then finally, this idea that recognition is computed based on similarity gives us competition effects, such as the finding that words with few neighbors are more intelligible than words with many neighbors. A word with few neighbors doesn't have a lot of things that are phonologically similar to it. So when I'm computing that similarity metric to say, what is this thing that I'm hearing, there's not as much stuff, there's not as, much, there's not as many uh, competitors that it could be, right? There aren't as many choices, there aren't as many possibilities. And so uh, when there are fewer competitors, my computation of similarity and figuring out what I'm hearing is easier. Similarly, if we think about speaking style, clear speech is characterized by hyperarticulation. So in the acoustic space, you're getting um, sounds that are more different from each other, more distinct, right? The vowel space spreads out. So an E is more different from an I in clear speech than in plain speech. So again, we get less competition there. So we get um, better intelligibility. And then um, you might also argue that um, this notion of competition could also account for a predictability effect where um, predictable words are more intelligible than unpredictable words. If I know what's coming, because it's predictable, I can exclude a lot of the options, right? And I can say, well, I'm not really sure what that word is, but I know that it's not cat or caught, so it must be kit, because kit's the only thing that makes sense, right? Note that this requires sort of another mechanism of being able to say there's stuff that I'm going to exclude from my computation of similarity, there's stuff that I'm going to ignore and trying to figure out what I'm saying, right? So it doesn't um, derive directly from this um, notion of recognition being computed based on similarity. It does require an additional mechanism of being able to select which of the things I'm even going to consider to start with. And we're going to come back to that. All right, so the big question that I'm going to talk about today is how do linguistic and social sources of variability interact in lexical processing? So most of the research that's been done so far has looked at these factors individually, but the speech that we encounter has all of these sources of variability in it, right? Words always have frequency, speakers always have a gender, they always have a place that they're from, and so anytime we're listening to speech, all of this stuff is in the signal. And so um, what I've been working on for the last five or so years is what do we do when all of that stuff is there at the same time? Let's actually look at what happens with all of these sources of variability in the same place at the same time. So I'm going to look at two particular sets of interactions here. The first is lexical competition, so this notion of words competing with each other because they're similar in some way and how that interacts with regional dialect, and in particular, the dialect of the talker, the dialect of the listener, and the local dialect context of the experiment. And then second, I'm going to talk about phonetic reduction, so related to um, this idea of speaking style and other variables that sort of affect how similar or not um, words are, vowels are, and the vowel space, for example and how that interacts with social factors, and in particular, focusing on talker gender and regional dialect. 
So we're going to look first at lexical competition and regional dialect, and we're going to talk about lexical competition in the context of neighborhood density. So the idea is that you can talk about how many words are similar to another word, that's its neighborhood density, the number of neighbors that it has, where a neighbor is the number of words differing from the target word by one phoneme, insertion, deletion, or substitution. So for example, if we take the word cat, it has neighbors including mat and bat and kit and cot and cab and cap and others. Its neighbors are basically words that form minimal pairs with it, right? And the idea then is that when you have phonological similarity, so when you have a lot of words that are similar to you, there's competition among the lexical candidates. So when I'm listening to the word cat, I also have to consider Maybe I heard mat, maybe I heard bat, maybe I heard cot, maybe I heard cat, etc. The dialects that I'm going to focus on throughout the talk are regional dialects of American English. And most of the research on regional variation in American English has focused on acoustic phonetic variation in the vowel space. There is also some variation in consonants and in prosody and intonation, but most of the research is on um, variation in the vowel space, and that's what we're going to focus on today, too. I'm going to talk about two regional dialects, the Midland dialect, which is spoken in the central and southern part of the Midwest, so where we are now, um, and including central and southern Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, etc. And then the northern dialect, which is spoken in the northern Midwest, so northern Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, etc. And up here I have the vowel spaces for um, these two varieties. So the IPA symbols are sort of where we expect standard American English to be, if there is such a thing. And then the arrows indicate how the vowels in these two varieties are shifted relative to that sort of idealized dialect. So in the Midland dialect, you have fronting of the back vowels, U, uh, and O. Oh, and then lowering of open O, as in caught, to something closer to caught. Um, for a long time, people said that those two vowels were actually merged. They may actually not be. There may be still a small distinction uh, maintained between caught, C A U G H T, and caught, C O T. The northern vowel space is quite different. It has this rotation of the low and low mid vowels, so raising and fronting of A something like ea, yeah, so bad, backing and lowering of ed, something like bed, and then um, backing of a uh, towards a, uh, lowering of a uh, towards a, uh, and then fronting of a uh, towards a, uh. so again, like in Chicago, right, that middle syllable, that's that fronting of a, uh. uh, and then it sometimes also lowers because it's a lax vowel like s, so it likes to do what ed does. Okay. Uh, in northern Ohio, you'll hear so raising and fronting of ad, lowering and backing of ad, and fronting of ah, those are the three most, sort of, the strongest features that we get around here. So, <coughs> when we have this variation, as these vowels are moving around in this space, it's changing the phonetic similarity between the vowels, right? So when we're talking about lexical competition and neighborhood density, we're talking about phonological similarity, right? So sharing all but a single phoneme. When we're talking about dialect variation now, we're talking about phonetic similarity or acoustic similarity and how the relationships between the vowels actually change. And so as a result of, say, the raising of A and the lowering of E, you get within and across dialects different patterns of phonetic similarity between the vowels that you might predict would change how words compete. Right? So if um, my all is lowered in either of these dialects towards an ah, then caught and caught might be more confusable. They might be more in greater competition because they are acoustically more similar. So we're going to look at how dialect variation impacts lexical competition in word recognition and in uh, encoding in two experiments, in a cross-modal priming experiment and then in a recognition memory. So this first experiment is a cross-modal priming study that I did with Abby Walker, who's now at Virginia Tech. Uh, 
And in this task, we used a cross-modal lexical decision task. So on every trial in the experiment, participants hear a word over the headphones, and then they see a letter string on the screen, and they have to decide whether that letter string is a real word or a nonsense word. And there are three critical types of trials in this experiment that I'm going to focus on. So there were matching prime target pairs where they, for example, heard the word bad and then saw the letter string BAD. There were competing prime target pairs where, for example, they heard the word bed and saw the letter string BAD. So bed and bad are minimal pairs, right? They're competitors. And then there are unrelated prime target pairs where, for example, they heard the word chill and saw the letter string BAD. And we're going to compare how quickly they respond to that letter string BAD in each of these three trial types. To get at this question about dialect variation and its role in this notion of competition, the primes, the auditory primes, were produced by speakers from the Midland and Northern dialect regions with these different vowel systems. And then we also looked at um, how the listeners' dialect exposure affected performance. So we had 55 monodialectal Midland listeners and 52 multidialectal listeners. These are people, they'd all lived in the Midland because that's where the experiment was done in Columbus. Um, but they, most of these multi-dialectal listeners had also lived in the North, most but not all. Okay. All right, so the first thing that we looked at here was how much uh, having a matching prime and target facilitates responses. So on the y-axis here we have facilitation, so this is the difference in response time between these matching prime target pairs, bad, bad, and the unrelated prime target pairs, so chill, bad. And these are negative, so it's faster response times when the prime and target match. Okay. On the left, we have the monodialectal listeners, and on the right, we have the multidialectal listeners. And then the colors are two different kinds of trials. So in the orange, we have trials like bad, bad, so they hear bad and they see BAD where the word bad itself has a competitor like bed. Okay. And then in the purple, we have words that we're calling no competitors uh, because they don't have this kind of minimal pair. So this is a word like calf, so they hear the word calf and then they see C-A-L-F. Calf doesn't have a minimal comp pair competitor with E, right? Calf is not a real word. So what we find is that there's more facilitation overall for the monodialectal listeners on the left than the multidialectal listeners on the right. There's also more facilitation for the no competitor words, so the words that don't have this a eh competitor, than for the words that do. But that difference between the no competitor case and the competitor case is much larger for the monodialectal listeners than the multidialectal. The third trial type that we looked at were these competing trials where they heard bed and saw BAD. And here we're looking at inhibition, so how much harder it is to identify BAD as a real word when you've just heard a word that's an awful lot like it, so bed. So again on the y-axis we have the difference between um, their reaction times in this competitor condition, so the bed-bad case, versus the unrelated trial type, so chill-bad. And response times are slower, longer, when they're listening to this competitor case than the unrelated case. And we see that, again, for both the monodialectal and the multidialectal listeners, you get this inhibition, but there's more inhibition for the monodialectal listeners. So first, we basically replicated other work. Phonological similarity leads to lexical competition. Okay. So there's less facilitation for matching prime target pairs with competitors than without competitors. So if a word doesn't have a competitor, it's easier to say, ah, oh, match, it's a word. There's also significant inhibition for these competing prime target pairs for everyone, right? So if I hear bed, it's harder to say that bad is a real word because I'm confused because I'm still thinking about bed, right? 
So lexical competition leads to activation of these multiple targets. I hear bed, both bed and bad get activated, it's confusing to me. Or I hear bad and both bed and bad are activated, it's confusing to me. And so that delays my lexical decision judgments. Right? This is, we already know this. Right? What's interesting is that this effect interacts with dialect exposure, right? Our multi-dialectal versus our mono-dialectal listeners. The multi-dialectal listeners have a reduced competitor effect on facilitation for those matching prime target pairs, and they also show reduced inhibition for the competing prime target pairs. So, uh, Abby and I have argued that this difference between the two listener groups reflects more fle a more flexible processing strategy for the multi-dialectal listeners relative to the mono-dialectal listeners. Our argument is similar to something that Bershma has put forward for bilinguals, which is that um, these multi-dialectal listeners maintain more options available for longer, right? So they have keep a longer activation of multiple targets because they know that there's variability out there. So they don't want to commit too soon. By keeping multiple targets active for longer, that leads to greater lexical competition, which reduces the facilitation, right? I heard bad, but I'm still considering maybe dead, so then seeing bad, I'm not quite as fast. But it also reduces the inhibition. I heard bad, but I'm kind of thinking about bad still, so when I see bad, it's less of a problem. So here then we have evidence that dialect exposure interacts with lexical competition. It affects how um, the lexical competition plays out in these two cases. And in one case, it's kind of a cost, right? Because you're getting less facilitation. But in the other case, it's a benefit. You're getting less inhibition as well. All right. So then if we turn to this recognition memory study that I did with Terence Mahdi and Janet Pierre Humbert, we find some additional evidence for dialect exposure, but also some effects of these other um, phenomena that uh, were in the title of the talk. So the context and task demands. So in this recognition memory study, we have a word recognition and noise task. So people hear words mixed with noise and they type what they hear. It's a blocked study test design, so in the study phase they hear a set of words and they say, and they type what they hear, right? In the test phase they do the very same thing, but they're presented with different kinds of words. So they're presented with the study words again, so these are old words in the context of the experiment. They're presented with new words, so words that they didn't hear previously. And then so that we can get at this question about lexical competition, they're also presented with minimally paired words. So for example, they might have heard bad in the study phase, and now they get bed in the test phase. And as in the previous experiment, the words are produced by Midland and Northern talkers, and our listeners vary in their dialect exposure. Here we have 22 Midland listeners and 20 Northern listeners. The experiment is again conducted in the Midland region, so these northern listeners really have exposure to multiple dialects, to both the Midland and the North. So the first um, phenomenon that we looked at with these data is a repetition benefit. So this is how much your accuracy improves in the test phase relative to the study phase as a function of having heard the words already. Okay? So these are different scores here, improvement in accuracy in the test phase relative to the study phase. Right? So I already heard all of these words, and now how much better am I when I hear them the second time? We had three different trial types for these previously studied words. They could either be repeated in the test phase by the same talker, by a different talker from the same dialect, or by a different talker from the other dialect. And then again, the, uh, we've got the talkers producing these words are from two different regions, so the yellow is Midland and the purple is North. So what we see then is a significant repetition benefit, that is, you're more accurate when you've heard the words before. For the same talker Midland trials, so they heard the word in the study phase and the test phase by the same Midland speaker, 
For the Midland, different talker trials, so they heard the same word in the study and test phases by two talkers from the Midland dialect. And then in the different dialect trials for the northern talkers, so these are words that they heard in the study phase from the Midland talker, and then in the test phase from a northern talker. And in the other three conditions, we don't see any repetition benefits, like they didn't hear the word at all, it doesn't help. So what this means then is that in the three conditions where they heard the word in the study phase by a talker from the Midland dialect, they get a repetition benefit. Priming, basically. They remember it's helpful to have heard it before. Right? But if the word was produced in the study phase by a northern talker, there's no benefit to that. They don't get any better. find something similar when we look at minimal pair interference. So again, this is where they heard a study word and then uh, in the test phase they heard a, a neighbor of that word. Okay. And all of these minimal pair words were like our different dialect trials, so they were produced in the study phase by a talker from one dialect and then in the test phase by a talker from the other dialect. And I've got other new words up here, so just words that they just hadn't heard before, but also weren't similar to something for comparison. So in the Midland Talkers row, this is where they heard a new word by a Midland Talker, so shoot, and they were 68% correct. And if they heard a minimally paired word by a Midland Talker, so let's say they heard the word bad in the test phase, but they previously heard the word bed by a Northern Talker in the study phase, they're 63% correct. So there's no difference there. It's not, it's no different. Right, whether it's a totally new word or whether it's a middle pair. But if we look at the northern talker row, we see a different pattern. They're also fine when it's a completely new word. So a northern talker can say the word cake, no problem. But when they were presented with a minimal pair of a study word that had been produced by a midland talker, that's hard. Okay? So for example, if they heard a midland talker say the word dub, and then they were presented with a northern talker in the test phase saying the word dog, they're only 40% correct. And a lot of these errors reflect these vowel shifts that we know about, right? So having heard a midland talker say a word that's a neighbor of this northern talker saying the word, you get interference, it's hard, right? You're distracted by that midland word that you previously heard. So taken together, these two sets of results, the repetition benefit and the minimal pair interference, suggest that the Midland tokens are encoded more strongly during the study phase than the Northern tokens for both listener groups. So I didn't show you the data separately here by listener group, but there are no differences. The Midland listeners and the Northern listeners both show this effect, where you get repetition benefits for studied Midland words only and a minimal pair interference for studied Midland words only. So what this suggests is that the local dialect context, remember the experiment was conducted in the Midland region, is shaping lexical encoding. And in particular, it suggests that the non-local dialect, this northern dialect, is exhibiting greater competition, both from study to test, in the case of the minimal pair interference, but perhaps also even in the initial recognition phase during the study part of the task. And we've argued that it's normalization for the non-local dialect that's inhibiting encoding even when recognition is accurate. So in the study phase, the Midland tokens were not recognized more accurately than the Northern tokens, right? So in terms of overall accuracy, there's no difference here. It's, in, it's what happens after the words get recognized in the study phase. And in particular, these Northern tokens, they don't get stored. Right? If you're thinking about your exemplar, you heard it, but then you don't put it in that cloud. It goes away, so then it doesn't contribute to a repetition benefit later, and it doesn't lead to minimal pair interference later. There was, however, a small effect of dialect exposure. So the northern listeners showed a larger repetition benefit, especially for that different dialect case. And so I said in the previous experiment that 
uh, we thought that dialect exposure maybe led to a more flexible processing strategy where people kept sort of more lexical competitors open for longer. This result with the greater repetition benefit overall for the northern listeners suggests that they may also activate more exemplars in computing the similarity in general, right? So they say, okay, I heard the word bad, and so even though the dialect has changed, I'm going to compare this new token to more stuff, and they're still going to get a repetition benefit there. So the idea is that they're more flexible both in sort of how many lexical targets they consider, but also how many exemplars within a particular lexical category they might consider as being similar for computing um, the similarity metric and identifying the We also found some evidence for um, effects of task demands in this experiment. So we ran a parallel explicit recognition memory task where in the study phase people identified the words, but this time they were presented without noise. And then in the test phase, instead of just recognizing the words again, they said whether the word had been presented in the study phase, so whether it was old or new in the context of the experiment. And this task produces different results. So you get slower responses overall to the northern targets, right? So in terms of accuracy, there's no difference between the midland and northern targets, but now if it's a speeded task, there is, so northern targets are slower. And there's no repetition benefit or minimal pair interference differences between the two dialects in this task where the study phase was presented without noise. So what this suggests is that task demands impact the magnitude of the dialect effects. And this is similar to what Goldinger and McLennan and Luce and others have said about how the task affects other kinds of indexical effects on processing. So with respect to overall task difficulty here sort of operationalizes whether or not there's noise. If the task is easier, that is if there's no noise in the study phase, you get encoding of both the Midland and the Northern targets, there's no problem there. Normalization isn't hard enough when there's not also noise on top of the signal. But also whether or not responses are speeded impacts performance. So if responses aren't speeded, we don't see any differences in accuracy. When they are speeded, these differences emerge in the speed, right, in the response times. So by manipulating sort of how difficult the task is and the nature of that difficulty, noise versus not, speeded versus not, we can get different effects to pop out. All right, so then the question for this part here was how does dialect variation impact lexical competition and word recognition and encoding? And what we find is that the, the interactions here reflect more than just there's dialect and there's lexical competition, right? So the dialect exposure of the listeners matters, right? More exposure leads to more lexical competition, but uh, that actually has different effects, right? So there's less immediate facilitation, less immediate inhibition, but also uh, in the second experiment, more repetition benefits over the long term. The local dialect context also matters in reducing lexical competition so that we see stronger encoding of the local dialect regardless of um, where the listeners are from. And then task demands matter in that task difficulty and sort of how that task difficulty is realized, whether it's speed or noise, enhance these effects of exposure and local dialect context on lexical like, So then, moving on to the second part, we're going to look at phonetic reduction and social factors. Phonetic reduction is this idea, um, one way of, sort of characterizing phonetic reduction at least, is that easy words are phonetically reduced relative to hard words. And this reduction is realized in things like uh, vowel duration and vowel centralization. So a reduced word has a shorter vowel duration, it has more centralized vowels than an unreduced word. And these easy words are, can be characterized in a number of ways. So 
For example, high frequency words are easy relative to low frequency words, because I said earlier that high frequency words are more intelligible than low frequency words, right? Plain speech maybe is easier than clear speech. It's intended for someone who you think is going to understand you versus clear speech where you're hyper articulating for some reason, so you believe it's harder for the listener to understand you. And so one um, explanation for this pattern is that talkers conserve articulatory effort when they expect to be understood. So this is Lindley's uh, hypo and hyperarticulation theory. Uh, there are a lot of arguments one could make about why this probably isn't true. Um, but for our purposes, this is an okay way to sort of think about um, phonetic reduction and this idea that there are contexts in which I can afford to reduce my speech because I'm pretty sure that you know what I'm saying. Okay. Phonetic reduction is sort of interestingly tied to social factors in that there's some evidence that social identity is more strongly marked in the same context that promote reduction. So, uh, for example, there's a study of Oprah Winfrey's speech showing that she marks her African American identity more strongly in high frequency words than in low frequency words. There's work showing um, that people mark their gender identity more strongly in low density words, again, words that don't have a lot of competitors <coughs> relative to high density words. Uh, and that um, these vowel shifts that I showed you marking regional identity uh, are more extreme in high predictability words. Right? So the idea here, one idea here that um, Janet and I have argued is that talkers highlight their social identity when they expect to be understood, right? So in the same way that I can be lazy when I think you can understand me, I can also tell you something about myself when I think that you're going to be able to understand me. So we know then that phonetic reduction and social factors interact with production, and an obvious question to ask is, well, what happens in perception? Okay. And I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to the cross modal grinding study. So this is work that I'm doing with my current graduate student, uh, Zach Jones. And the design here is very similar to um, the first experiment that I talked about. So it's cross modal with lexical decision. You hear a word, you see a letter string, and you decide whether the letter string is a real word or a nonsense word. And here we've got two critical types of trials, the matching prime target pairs, bad, bad, and the unrelated prime target pairs, chill, bad. And the primes here were extracted from red short stories that varied, the words varied in frequency and neighborhood density and predictability and whether they were the first mention or the second mention and also speaking style, clear versus plain speech, and we also have male and female speakers and Midland and Northern speakers. And I'm going to focus just on the frequency of the word and the speaking style and the gender in this experiment. And we have listeners who vary in their dialect exposure. So here we have 37 Midland listeners, 24 Northern listeners, and then 23 multi-dialectal listeners. So these are people who lived in two or more places that were not just the Northern and the Midland. Again, the experiment was conducted in the Midland. So if we look first at the effect of the frequency of the auditory prime on the lexical decision times, we have the matching primes shown in the red line and the unrelated prime is shown with the green line. And what we see is that for the matching primes, as frequency increases, response times get faster. That's not surprising, right? High frequency words are easier than low frequency words. What's interesting is that our acoustic analysis shows that those high frequency words are in fact shorter and more reduced than the low frequency words, right? So the frequency of the word overrides, the sort of easiness of understanding high frequency words overrides that phonetic reduction effect. But only for the matching primes. For the unrelated primes, the effect goes in the other direction, and it's actually harder the higher the frequency of the prime is, right? Perhaps because it's reduced, perhaps because you've got a lot of activation for that high frequency 
prime, right? And you've got competition. Speaking style is another way of kind of thinking about this notion of reduction, right? Clear speech is going to be hyper-articulated, less reduced relative to plain speech. And here we find an interaction with talk or gender. So on the right, we've got our matching primes again. And you can see the pattern that we saw from the first that, uh, from the first experiment, that the matching primes are faster than the unrelated primes. So you've got priming overall. But if we look just at our matching primes, we also see a pattern here where responses are slower following a plain speech prime relative to a clear speech prime. That would be consistent with reduction, right? The plain speech primes are reduced, and so they provide less facilitation. They're harder to recognize, and so uh, you get uh, slower responses even when it matches relative to these hyper-articulated clear primes if we look at the unrelated primes, we see a different pattern where it's only for the male speakers on the right that there's this style effect. So it's only for the male speakers that the plain primes slow down responses relative to the clear primes. So then the phonetic reduction effects on priming are inconsistent. You get faster responses for matching high frequency primes even though they're really reduced. But you get slower responses for the unrelated high frequency primes consistent with them being reduced. And you get slower responses for the matching plain speech primes also consistent with them being reduced. And so what Zach and I have suggested is that uh, it's listener expectations about the context that contribute to these effects. And in particular, all else being equal, if you play me a word, I'm going to expect it to be a high frequency word. Right? So I have expectations about words, high, I'm just more likely to encounter a high frequency word. Right? And so that expectation can override the reduction in the case of these matching primes. We also think that listeners have expectations about the style of speech that they're going to hear in a laboratory setting. If you come into the lab and you do an experiment, you probably expect that they're going to play you speech that you can understand. It's hyper-articulated that's produced, individual words produced in isolation even. These are words extracted from running speech from passages. So uh, this deficit here for the plain speech primes in the matching case may reflect this expectation that the speech is not as clear as it should be in a lab context. So that makes it harder. So one of the things that we're going to be doing is putting these um, words back in their context and see how that changes. But there's also this um, interaction between gender and style for the unrelated primes, where you get the slower responses overall for the unrelated male plain speech primes. And there isn't a corresponding gender by style interaction and reduction if you look at the acoustics. So this can't be driven by the acoustics. And this is also a different pattern than the word recognition task that I skipped over, where we find that the hardest uh, materials are the plain speech primes produced by the women. So this suggests, again, that there's something about task demands that are relevant here. In this task, there's no noise. In the experiment three that I didn't talk about, there is noise, right? So this different pattern of interactions between style and gender may reflect, again, whether there's noise in the stimulus and whether or not the responses are speeded. So here the responses are speeded in a word recognition and noise task, but they're not. So how does phonetic reduction and social factors interact in lexical processing? Again, there are interactions, but they're mediated by these other factors. So experimental context in particular, perhaps the expectations about stimulus materials about what you expect to hear in a context like an experiment, such as whether or not they're going to be reduced or what the local dialect is, and then also the task demands and whether the difficulties coming from there being noise or coming from the experiment being speeded can affect um, which things prove to be more difficult. All right. So then coming back 
to the big question, which is how do these sources of variability interact? Well, they interact in interesting ways that are shaped by these three factors, dialect exposure, experimental context, and task demands. The dialect exposure effects were shown in the first two experiments, and I suggested that listeners with exposure to multiple different dialects exhibit a more flexible processing strategy that involves a longer activation over time of multiple lexical candidates, as well as activation of more exemplars for computing the similarity metric. Overall, this is leading to greater lexical competition that has both costs and benefits. So it reduces immediate facilitation, but it also reduces immediate inhibition, and it enhances the long-distance repetition benefit. So overall, the benefits outweigh the costs. This is actually a reasonable strategy for someone with exposure to variability to adopt, right? To keep their options open longer. I've got five minutes left. Okay, we'll, we'll wrap up. So we've got to get out of here. Yeah. Um, the, with respect to experiment context, the listener expectations about what they're going to hear impacts processing, and the results suggest that uh, the stimulus materials will be high frequency produced in the local dialect and hyper articulated. And then finally, with respect to task demands, the interactions that we see between these two factors differ depending on whether there's speed, whether there's noise, etc. So, the take home message is that the speech signal is highly variable, this, this variability is structured and informative, but it also significantly impacts the speed and accuracy of lexical processing, and the impact of this variability is further affected by exposure, by context, and by task demands. Thank you. <laughs>